Uh, my name is Ron. I'm from the company Defiant, and uh, I'm here to present Defiant HDL or DFHDL, uh, the concept of three abstractions in one uh, hardware description language. Uh, but also, when I uh, pre prepared this presentation, I understood <coughs> that many of the concepts may not be so obvious, so I expanded the talk and tried to fit everything with it in uh, 15 minutes and starting with the ABCs of HDL, and the ABCs is not, uh, oh, this doesn't work, uh, the ABCs are not uh, HDNL, no, it's uh, something different. Uh, a bit of history, I've been doing this for a while, uh, ever since my master's degree. Uh, in the beginning it was called uh, Cafeo, it was like a ball of yarn of a hardware description language, everything mixed together, uh, but it showed the promising results. Later on, I started my PhD, uh, did five years on this subject, and it uh, separated the IR from the front end and the back end, and uh, integrated with a European project. Again, good results, but not uh, industry ready. Uh, I started my postdoc at Cornell, and then uh, restarted it from scratch yet again. Um, now the defiant uh, is the company name, and basically the, the language is called the Defined HDL, and I'm here to present uh, three abstractions in the same language. Uh, let's start with terminology, also known as the point where I piss everyone off. Um, HDL. And HDL is a language with a subset that is specified or standardized to describe uh, synthesizable logical circuits. Okay, uh, this means that Verilog, VHDL, Chisel, or the ACT asynchronous design language are all HDLs. C, Scala, Python, HTML are not. Also, my uh, beef uh, recipe is not an HDL as well. Um, RTL 11, I added an extra L here specifically to separate the level and the language. And RTL is an HDL that is only describes RTL code, which is limited to a circuit of composition of uh, wires, combination logic, registers, and macros or black boxes. Um, so now is, we're going to be angry. Um, so Spinal HDL, Chisel, Amaranth, BlueSpec are RTL language, languages, but Verilog and VHDL are not because they are, do not exclusively allow us to describe RTL languages. They are used to describe RTL code, but when we use them for simulation, we are not writing RTLs. I'm sorry. Um, Domain-specific languages, you hear DSL. So a DSL, DSL um, in generally, you take uh, one language, it's hosting a specific API for a specific purpose. Uh, in the context of an HDL, uh, an HDL uh, domain-specific language is used to construct uh, hardware in some semantic or another. So Spinal HDL, Chisel, and Amaranth, yes, again, they are um, DSL. Verilog and VHDL are not. Uh, BlueSpec also not a DSL. It's a hardware description language, an RTL language, but it's not a DSL language. And we have this small Venn diagram here that a DSL cannot, can also be not an HDL, of course, and also DSL can be an RTL language or it can be an HDL which is not an RTL language. So it's uh, important to distinguish these differences. As for HLS, HLS are not languages, they are tools that uh, take, uh, transform non-HDL code into hardware or synthesizable HDL code. Um, they also have another uh, possible options, we won't discuss that at the moment. So H HLS are not tools, so if you have a tool that transforms the C to Verilog or MATLAB to Verilog, that is an HLS tool. Uh, Chisel is not an HLS tool. Okay, now that we have gone through the, uh, the terminology, uh, let's uh, start with the ABCs. So the A is for abstraction automation. When you start to, if you want to uh, go ahead and after this talk, hey, this is something cool, I want to do something better, and you want to start doing an HDL yourself, there are a lot of them, dozens, and what I've seen so far that's missing is attention to these three parts, especially in terms of time and state. Uh, in how design languages, uh, we have, uh, we are describing using usually in RTL language, you're using a, a cycle based time to uh, abstract over state and then the state bo is bound to time and it doesn't need to be explicitly so. So the, how you express 
state and time is something that is uh, crucial. How you express concurrency is something that is crucial, very natural in how the description language, not natural in others. And how do you express data validity? That is also uh, crucial. And these three together, if you try to press in von Neumann type of C code into, and using that for hardware description, this is, it doesn't hold up, I'm sorry. Um, this is one of the, the ways that HLS tools help us in some algorithms, but if we want to describe a processor in HLS tool, good luck with that. Um, so that's why I came up with a, what I call a data flow, data flow hardware description abstraction. And below you see different use, use cases for registers, and they are split into three groups. Uh, one group, um, which is just a synchronous backend, if you specify uh, registers and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, pipelining registers or path balancing registers or synchronizers, these are just registers that are not part of the function, they are part of the backend. The middle group is a, is there are a group of registers that uh, are bound to time. So you want, when your function has time component to it, if you want to blink a LED at, any, at some given rate, then those reg registers are used to, uh, for you in RTL to express time. The last group of registers is when, uh, when you want to describe a state, and even then you have different kinds of state, one called derived, derived state, another called commit state, I won't get into that. The concept in a data flow language is to abstract over those registers in a different kind of, uh, of, of construct for each one of those use cases. The, in, and in DFHDL, we take it further and we have the high level data flow abstraction, but we also have two additional abstractions below it. One is the register transfer, which is equivalent to the register and spinal amaranth type of uh, abstractions, and event-driven, which is equivalent to Verilog and DHDL, all within the same language in a coherent way that you can uh, control both. Now, okay, I have the, my abstraction, I know what to do with it. Um, now I want to start designing my language. So what are the bases where I, which, which I use to design my language? There are uh, different ways we can go about it. There are a group of host DSLs, now we know what are uh, DSLs. So I choose a host language, I write a library or API within that language, and then um, I create my HDL. That is one approach. The other approach, nope, I'm no creative. Um, I write my own parser and compiler and everything from scratch. And uh, we have another group of languages. One I call inspired syntax and the other in unique. So inspired, you look some, at some other language syntax like Spade from Rob, inspired by Ross and BSV or TL Verilog, like an expansion of Verilog and things like that. Or you, ha and you, or you have unique syntax like languages like Silis or SUS. Um, and you have this small third group that maybe there are other languages in it which kind of, kind of in-between approach that takes uh, a host language and use a bunch of annotations and uh, disconnect you from the real compiler walkthrough walk of uh, running a program in the usual sense, like it happens in hosted DSLs. So these are like the three major groups. And there are is advantages and disadvantages to each. Uh, I mean, if we go the independent way, we have full control over everything. We design everything. But then if we design everything, we have no ecosystem. We want to be, we need to create our own compile, uh, I plug in for the IDE. We need to uh, have a publishing tool. We need to have a linting, everything we need to do ourselves, which is not uh, so, so smart, so, so fun. I don't know, it depends on what your, your fun is. And we have uh, the bunch of ho uh, hosted DSLs, which, okay, we, we can enjoy the full ecosystem, but then we have limitations. We have keywords that we cannot overload, and we need to control, we, ex we expose cons uh, context to the user. Uh, here in one example that we need to use the, co to expose the context that we need to add things to the HDL instead of expressing HDL, or we have m.if instead of just expressing f. Um, so again, we are kind of, uh, we, we are trying to find a better position in between, 
And again, in the FHDL, the, the concept of compromise and trying to have the cake and eat it too. And the C is, of course, about the compromise and everything is C. Like, uh, we need a clear, concise, and consistent language. We want concurrency, we want cycle accuracy, we want correctness, we want control, yet we want to be conservative, we want to be compact and safe, and everything is stretching in every way. Every way. So basically, it's the art of compromise that you, when you're trying to design an HDL, you need to go through. So let's see some code, but not C code. Uh, right now, we will uh, have this um, um, demo for the live demo of uh, an OCOF design module. And this design will calculate how much knowledge was ob obtained by an OCOF participant, okay? So this is basically what you start. You import defined HDL and you write uh, the, the class OCOF extends, in this case, DF design, which is a data flow design. Um, if I start with RT design, RT is a register transfer uh, abstraction. If I start with ED, event driven abstraction. Okay, currently nothing really happens because I've done nothing. If I annotate the design with top, then immediately I am able to run something. What does it do? So, uh, as you will see, it already compiles the design, commits the design to, to disk space, and does several things. It also says, okay, no command like given, using defaults, and so, so, so. Uh, so let's see what happens. Um, let's specify um, the, the help and see uh, what, what it gives us. So uh, welcome to define HDL. It gives you the version, which is a local uh, snapshot version, and design name orconf, and then it gives us a bunch of things that we can do. So already now, because we annotated the, 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 the class top, we have and uh, loads of options that we can just use. And what it means in all those all loads of we can use, uh, for example, even if I go forth and go and add, uh, let's say, um, how much coffee we get, which is none at the moment. <laughs> so at the moment we start with zero coffee. Um, and if I uh, started off with that, and, and then run the, the help yet again. In the beginning, we see that uh, design arguments, we have coffee, which is an integer, and currently we have zero of it. Um, sorry, and, uh, and I'm keeping you from it. Um, so this is uh, the basic thing. So when you create a design, you can basically uh, use this stuff and release it to other people, and they can use it to compile and, and generate. They can use it, also use it for publishing. I mean, in Scala, Scala CLI now is a publishing tool. Basically, in one line of command, this all conf module, you can publish it and others can download it, depend on it, and just use it. We talked about uh, uh, things like uh, Fuse SOC. This is built in because this is Scala. Okay, let's do something a little bit more, com uh, a little bit uh, more uh, complicated. Um, so, I'll just use a wait statement here, uh, which, uh, which will continuously run uh, the code um, whenever I, I make a change. Uh, and now let's see what is going on. So at the beginning, let's uh, do something uh, nice and add uh, inputs and outputs. So right now I have my uh, knowledge in, uh, which is, I don't have a lot of knowledge, but eight bits is enough. So uh, uh, this is in. I have my knowledge out. And then currently I learned nothing, sorry. Um, so again, it compiles and does everything. Now let's, let's, uh, if, instead of going into the, the opening the file to generate, let's print it out. So uh, all you need, again, this is Scala, you have a way to pass options in a given, in a, an implicit way. In this case, I will choose the, um, um, the compiler options and uh, print uh, the backend code, and then I'll set that to true. And when I save it, And when I save it, I get uh, the, uh, the printed out um, uh, all, all conf module in Verilog. 
And when, uh, and if I want to specify which backend to use, so I can specify VHDL inside, and it will print out, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course. Um, so I specify VHDL and said it will print out the, the VHDL code. And also, I mean, possibly uh, there is, uh, I, um, not only VHDL, you can specify, sorry, uh, you can specify uh, which dialect, so as well, Verilog, choose a dialect and, uh, and use that, and the compiler will use that dialect to the best of its abilities to make the most readable code that is, uh, uh, can be used. So right now, uh, this is, uh, I still obtain some knowledge. Um, so um, I started with some initial knowledge, which is zero. I know, knew nothing, but now after a day of lectures, I have the, the previous value uh, plus, uh, I know, five bits, five values of knowledge. And then I can um, see the generated code. But I don't, have really, I don't really need to look at the generated code. I can um, print out um, for example, the, uh, the defined HDL code after, uh, after these uh, processes. So if I look uh, beforehand, I will also see the defined HDL code that generated the eventual ED domain of the code. So now you have the clock, the reset, the inputs and outputs and things like that. Uh, defined HDL provides you with a lot of thing, uh, nice things as well because now I know that uh, if coffee is zero, then I learned nothing. Otherwise, I'm able to obtain some kind of knowledge. Okay? And here in this case, I, already, I use Scala if and Scala else to express, uh, the, uh, to express the, uh, the, the knowledge that I, uh, that I obtain. Okay? This, you have Scala if and Scala else, and, uh, and, and the compiler did whatever it needed to do. But Okay, the, the, let's say uh, the compiler did crazy, crazy, crazy stuff and you want to be able to um, uh, understand what is going on because again, I'm saying this is not an HLS, but you still want to know um, what are the steps that it went through. Um, so all again, all you need to do is again, turn on some kind of option and in this case, the compiler option and I will uh, set a log level into trace mode. Now it will bring, print out a bunch of code. But then, and then I will increase this because now it's the end. Uh, sorry. Ah, I'm not able to. Zoom in, sorry. Uh, so it runs a lot of different stages that do nothing until it does something and it will print it out. So when it went from the data flow domain to the register transfer domain, it transferred a prev statement into a reg statement. Uh, it looks for you the same, but they are essentially very, very different. Uh, there, there's a lot of complexity to it, but I won't get into it now. And finally, uh, this, this reg statement uh, is a uh, reg alias, and it changed into explicit in the initialization that it took from the input. So at the beginning, there was an, initial, in, an input initialization, then it transferred into the alias. And then uh, you have uh, a different way to express a register, which is not through an alias, and an explicit variable, which is a register, and then it, it, they, it did that. And then it, it got into having an explicit uh, uh, clock and reset configuration. So it took the default from the configuration and you can see that uh, implemented as well. Uh, and then it created 
a clock and reset signal uh, uh, types and it used them for, for the inputs. And these are actually called magnet types in defined HDL. And uh, finally, it created an event-driven domain uh, with the still the clock and the recent de uh, defaults, and it created the, the process and, and the clock uh, statements. Uh, and finally, finally, after getting rid of the magnet types, the clock is you have bit signals and, uh, and things like that. Um, before um, moving on to from a VHDL presentation to a Verilog presentation and things like that, it does other stages. Um, again, there's each step of the process, it prints out the code until finally <coughs> it gives you the code that you, you intended for the backend. And I'm about my cell carry time. You want to break, you can get it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think we we'll go without this, but any questions? Oh, I think you just need to speak up and maybe you can repeat the question. Okay. Um, so a few years ago, XKTV observed this sort of thing of um, lots of people you know, see a standard and go, that's not quite what I want, or, or I'll create another standard. We seem to be kind of doing it in the arts. But there seems to be this core problem that none of the vendors have looked at adopting these. So we still have to go to Verifon. So our commercial process, I still have to verify my Verifon. That doubles my verification effort, effectively. So do you, do you have a solution to that? Do you have sort of formal proofs that your counter and your correct? Um, OK, we got it. So the, the question was regarding uh, the still reliance of the industry on the existing Verilog and VHDL. And the question is whether there is a formal proof that the design is correct or not. Um, regarding formal proof, it depends on what level of design. What, what is the transformation? Not, um, we can, if you can, we can, it's a lengthy discussion about formal proof. But data flow gives you, uh, static data flow especially gives you uh, guarantees uh, that you know the transformation uh, before and transformation after, and you can use those guarantees for formal correctness. Um, but uh, as far as the reliance on the uh, on Verilog, Verilog, you can I look at them as like an assembly in a sense for for industry. The Intel and uh, AMD don't need to uh, move on with the assembly standard. It can remain as is, and you still have loads of software languages that eventually compile into the assembly, and they can and they develop processes for that assembly. Essentially, I see potential for hardware description languages to continue on in this path. Thank you. And uh, other questions? Yeah. Could this have been uh, an extension to Chisel? Uh, maybe, I'm not going to assess on this. First of all, there are a lot of things behind the scenes that uh, Chisel doesn't do. You can theoretically do that. First, you need to extend like the lower level of abstraction. So currently, their lower level of abstraction is still uh, register transfer level of abstraction, and then you can extend it, uh, and then you can extend it up. But essentially, extending Chisel is breaking, is basically breaking the entire syntax and using this one. Uh, so possible. So, uh, so the, the event-driven, the goal is to basically allow you everything that you're doing in Verilog, which is sane, the sane parts of Verilog or VHDL, to write that in event-driven. And if you look at the code, if I write, uh, I look at the event-driven code that is uh, at the end, for example, here you have a process which is uh, like an always block in, 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 in Verilog. And uh, you can have that combinational process. You can have that sequential process. And everything is, uh, is like you expect. You have the full control and you have um, uh, a blocking assignment, non-blocking assignments. In the register transfer and in the data flow section, all assignments are, are always blocking assignments, and there are guarantees that 
they, you do, cannot create latches. Uh, in here, in, when you're writing event-driven uh, um, dialect, you chose to use that level of abstraction, and you can theoretically create a latch. Up to you. Okay. Yeah, good. It's for low power design. You want yeah, yeah. I understand. So that's why the three abstractions is important. You look at, need to look at the entire use case uh, and how you can uh, use that. But you don't want so you. But you don't want to give away too much power with for everything. So you want the user to be able to say, this is my context. I'm writing a data flow. I'm writing a transfer. Or I'm writing event-driven abstraction. And using the same constructs within in each context is helping a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.